ladies and gentlemen, once again, please welcome to the stage Christine Keck, Managing Director of Federal Government Affairs for Vectron, a Centerpoint Energy Company, and the Chair of our Southwest Indiana Chamber Board of Directors. Thank you, thank you all. Second time around was good, wasn't it? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, well, so thank you all so much. We're um, thrilled to have you here tonight and uh, certainly in different circumstances, but Tara and I were just commenting, uh, everyone seems in very good spirits and we are really thrilled to see each of you this evening. So it is my uh, distinct pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening um, to our annual chamber annual meeting and dinner. Mayor, we wanna thank you so much for your very kind words which, as always, are very gracious and on point, so thank you so much. To follow on the mayor's comments, tonight we have the very distinct honor of having New York Fire Department Battalion Chief David Markle with us. Um, I hope many of you have had a chance to meet him. If you haven't, please stick around and do so later because he's a really awesome guy. Um, and we are equally honored to have with us this evening um, a whole host of our first responders. And how cool is it that we had the dogs and the horses? I mean, it's just the coolest thing. <laughs> I love it. So Evansville Fire Department, thank you for being here. Evansville Police Department, the Vandenberg County Sheriff's Department, and also our healthcare providers, as the mayor talked about so eloquently, we have phenomenal healthcare partners in this community, in this region. So Ascension St. Vincent Evansville and Deaconess Hospital, so all these physicians and medical personnel and essential service providers who truly have stepped up to assist us in keeping our businesses uh, operating and our citizens safe. We are just so grateful to you. Thank you, yes, yes. I love it that the dog's barking through this. This is, I feel like I'm in my own house right now, so this is so good. That's a whole separate story. Um, anyway, the Chamber of Commerce is proud. I've told you, many of you, this story of the dog training. It's not good. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce is so proud and honored to gather tonight, not just to take care of the business of the Chamber, but also, importantly, to extend our thanks and our appreciation to the many, many first responders, first responders who have sacrificed time with their families, uh, put their own health and safety on the line, and very often risk their own lives for those of us in this room and those of us joining us virtually. Let's this, get this evening off to a very good start. Would you please join me in standing ovation for our first responder community? From the bottom of our heart, uh, bottoms of our heart, we are so thankful to each of you for what you do on behalf of our community. So for those of you that I have not had the uh, pleasure yet of meeting in person, my name is Christine Keck. Uh, and my, so my day job is I uh, lead advocacy and policy engagement on the federal level for Centerpoint Energy, and I'm proud to do so. And I've had the huge, huge honor of serving as the chair of your chamber board of directors for these past two years. I can say with absolute certainty uh, that in your chamber board and staff, you are represented by individuals who challenge the status quo. Uh, they constantly seek new and more effective ways to support your business and to ensure that the community and the region that we call home is positioned to prosper and to grow. Tonight is about continuing the great work of this organization which has proudly served as the collective voice uh, of our regional business community since 1915. In 105 years, we have led through a multitude of opportunities and challenges, potentially none as tumultuous or difficult to navigate or just plain scary, frankly, as 2020. We have faced a pandemic, thousands of jobs lost, the closure of our economy, many hundreds of businesses at risk, all without a playbook. Yet, we are here tonight. As the needs of our members, our community, and our region evolve, the Southwest Indiana Chamber is by your side, engaging strategically and, and proactively, being nimble 
responding to the changes and ensuring that our region is positioned to thrive as a globally competitive place to work, to live, and to grow a business. This year, in response to the COVID-19 safety restrictions, we are hosting many here at the Ford Center, and it's so good to see you all in person, and many others of you are joining remotely. In fact, Tara tells me, we have a great crowd of over 700 people joining us this evening, virtually and in person. I think that I, we need applause for that. So welcome to all of you. Indeed, our members make this annual meeting and dinner possible. Please hold your applause until I have introduced all of tonight's sponsors. And as I introduce you, will you please stand? So our gold sponsors are Vectran, a Centerpoint Energy Company. Uh, our silver sponsors are Barry Gold Global, BKD, Fifth Third Bank, Old National Bank. Our signature series sponsors are Atlas World Group and RB. And a special thanks goes to our technology and virtual sponsor, Concept Sound and Light, who um, they are with us every year, but this year has been especially challenging. So they have gone far beyond uh, their usual support to bring our meeting to all of you tonight. Thank you guys. We also, all the beautiful greenery you see around you here. So that's from Wild Horticultural and Brian, Brian Wildeman, and you make our events so beautiful every time and you have done it again tonight. Thank you. Our live streaming sponsor is AstraZeneca Pharmaceuticals and our media sponsor is Town Square Media. Along with these exceptional businesses that I just mentioned that are all passionate about our community, we also wanna thank the more than 40 corporate table sponsors who are listed on your program and on the screen. Again, thank you all and how about a round of applause for all of them. So the Southwest Indiana Chamber is a, an association of businesses and individuals who come together for the benefit of our region. And that's all of you. You inform our priorities, our public policy agenda, our member benefits, and every aspect of our work and our services. You make our events successful and consistently the best attended programs in the community. You guide our talent and workforce initiatives and advise the Southwest Indiana Small Business Development Center, which we are very proud to host. You are represented by a terrific board of directors. I've had the privilege of chairing the Chamber's board for these past two years. These committed and engaged leaders challenge the status quo. They are quick to, to seek new and more effective ways to support our business environment and, and truly to position our region to prosper and grow. I want to give a special shout out also to our chair elect who will become the chair tonight, Kurt Begley with Berry Global. Kurt, you've been an awesome, awesome partner as my chair uh, elect, and I'm so grateful for your leadership. Thank you so much. And so 2020, this has been the year to have a really great board. Uh, without them, our staff, our public sector partners, our community's first responders, who we are so very proud to honor this evening, Greater Evansville and our region would be in far more challenging circumstances today. I would like to ask the members of the board to stand, those who are here, some are here in the room, some are participating remotely. And I'm confident that everyone here knows, yeah, please stand, if you're here, please. Um, I'm confident that everyone here uh, knows many of these amazing business leaders. Uh, they are your co-workers, they're your neighbors, they're your friends, customers. So please, if you have advice, if you have ideas or issues for the chamber, please share them with these leaders, with your board representatives. Again, thank you all so much for your leadership. So I mentioned another very critical um, partner in our work are our public sector. Uh, representatives, our elected officials, and I want to extend a special thanks to them this evening. Uh, many of them are here tonight. They serve us ably every year, and our region prospers because we have a strong balance between the public and private sectors in this region. Very critical. This year, they have also earned the honorific of first responders. 
please stand to be recognized. And would you please hold your applause as I recognize our leaders, please. Mayor Lloyd Winicky. Senator Vanita Becker, who's joining us virtually. Senator Jim Toms, who's with us. State Representative Ron Bacon, who's with us. State Representative Wendy McNamara, who is here with us. State Representative Ryan Hatfield. Vandenberg County Commissioner Ben Shoulders, who's here with us tonight. And Vandenberg County uh, Commissioner Cheryl Musgrave, who is joining us virtually. Now, did I miss any other elected officials? You can shout out, okay. Thank you all, thank you all for your service. And before I launch into what will be brief remarks, I promise, um, as I exit my role as chair, I wanna send a special thanks to, um, this is where you don't get emotional, right? So, um, right, we don't do this, um, right. Okay, we got it. Um, Center Point Energy is uh, my company, <clears throat> and I'm very thankful for their support. Uh, <clears throat> This role is sort of like uh, another day job. And so um, they have been very supportive of this. And I wanna thank you all. And um, Mike Rader and Jason Ryan, who I'm not sure if they're with us electronically or not, but I wanna give a shout out to them. Um, <clears throat> and I also wanna thank, Kurt, don't do this. Yeah, Kurt, don't do this when you take over. Um, I want to thank God and my husband uh, in that order. You faith-based people, you're like, you got God and then your spouse. Okay, so I want to thank God and my husband because without um, God's uh, provision and my husband's support, um, I could not do any of this. And I'm very grateful for all of you. Thank you. Okay. Didn't want to do that, crying, but that happens sometimes. Okay, at this time, I will formally call to order the annual meeting so that we can conduct uh, some brief business. So Jean Blanton, who's a partner with Zemer, Stamen, Weitzel & Shoulders, is chair of our governance committee and is with us remotely tonight. She has delegated her stage responsibilities this evening to my good friend and colleague, Dan Parad, who is the president of Ascension St. Vincent Hospital. Dan, would you take it from here, please? Well, good evening to everybody. And first, I want to say on behalf of the entire greater community, I want to thank uh, the Chamber of Commerce, led by Tara Barney, and also our Chair Christine Kack for just amazing leadership through an unprecedented time. Can we give them a round of applause? Thank you. So, so one of the responsibilities of the Chamber Governance Committee is to bring forward a slate of directors and officers for your consideration tonight. You will see the nominees scrolling on the screen as I will ask them to stand as I present the Governance Committee's recommendations for the 2020 and 21 new board members. First, the new board members we welcome are Harold Calloway, University of Southern Indiana trustee, Fred Emery, a commercial risk advisor of ONI Risk Partners, Chris Head, Senior Vice President, Retail Banking, Manager, First Federal Savings Bank. Mark Healy, Director of Quality, Ascension St. Vincent, Evansville. Court Call, Market President, the Greater Indiana Region and the Southern Market for Fifth Third Bank. Dr. James Porter, President of Deaconess Health System. Chad Sullivan, an attorney with Jackson Kelly. Ash Titzer, Director of Midstream at Country Mark. And Daniela Vidal, Chancellor of Ivy Tech Community College. These nine community leaders will join those continuing their terms on the chamber board. The balance of our directors are listed on the video screen. We recommend tonight the following officers for the coming year. First, the Office of the Chairman, Kurt Bagley, President of Health, Hygiene, and Specialties, Barry Gogol. Global. Thank you, Kurt, for saying yes and accepting this uh, leadership challenge. Office of the Chair-Elect, Yuk Lager, Market President for Indiana Members Credit Union. 
Office of the Secretary, Dr. James Porter, President of Deaconess Health System, and Office of the Treasurer, Dave Freeman, partner with BKD LLP. Now, if there are no nominations from the floor, I would ask for a motion to accept the slate of officers. Thank you. And all those in favor, would you please say aye? aye. And any opposed? Thank you to all and congratulations to those who are serving uh, on our chamber at this critical time. It's now my honor to thank some of my colleagues who are, have completed their terms of service here on the board uh, as directors. Two of them are with us tonight and I would invite them to the stage to be recognized. First, uh, Sean McCoy, CEO of Deaconess Health System. And uh, next, Keith Mesmer, partner of BKD. Thank you. We have a number of other outgoing board members who couldn't be with us tonight. Mike Head, CEO of First Federal Savings. Michelle Hudson, real estate agent for Schrode Agency. George Morgan, who recently retired as a manager of field operations for Countrymark, and Brad Mulebauer, president of Cook Air, and finally Scott Thomas. On behalf of the Southwest Indiana Chamber Governance Committee, I thank all of our board members for their service to this community. And Christine, this concludes the Governance Committee's responsibilities tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. So chambers of commerce are catalysts. They are conveners and champions for our members and the communities in which we proudly serve. So when COVID-19 came to our region and our public health partners made it clear, appropriately, that we would have to stay home and close business until we could safely manage the spread of the virus, we immediately pivoted to provide all businesses in the region, and frankly, not just our members, with the critical information and services that they needed. Very early into the pandemic, we mobilized internally and with our board to determine how best to change gears from our normal course of operations and step up as the spark for nimble, collaborative leadership to businesses and stakeholders throughout this region. With the able partnership of the Economic Development Coalition, Engage, we joined forces and quickly con converted the Chamber website to a business information portal. For the months that our region was essentially closed to commerce and normal business transactions, thousands of businesses found, and I might say can still find, uh, the accurate up-to-the-minute guidance and information that they needed to protect their businesses. We convened the boards of the Chamber, the Coalition, and Gage weekly, virtually, to stay current on the greatest needs of our businesses with the critical and very timely input of many public sector leaders, including Mayor Winicky and Congressman Bouchon, as well as our healthcare providers. These calls quickly turned into a vital and trusted resource of information guidance and collaboration to help our region navigate through these very turbulent times. We recognized that if we could execute successfully, this was actually an opportunity for our chamber to have an even broader and more lasting impact on the resilience and prosperity of our region. So that meant doing things like hosting virtual town halls with businesses of all shapes and sizes, from our largest manufacturers, our restaurant and retail businesses, and those such as childcare providers that are particularly critical to our employers. Because the restaurant industry was, so, was and still is so impacted, we worked with WFIE Channel 14 to showcase nearly 100 stories about local businesses that innovated, often adjusting their operating model overnight 
They shifted successfully to carry out, home delivery, and many other creative ways to keep their businesses operating. We talked to our members. Tara tells me this was something like 2,757 calls, to be exact, uh, to see what you, our members, needed. We had our members step up to share their expertise with free webinars that served their fellow businesses. I mean, they did this without compensation. We are so grateful. And we surveyed, we surveyed a lot. Your willingness to share your situation and your most critical needs from your business perspective allowed us to respond immediately. It allowed us to respond with marketing assistance, um, access to emergency loans and grants to keep the doors open, and with best practice programming on new issues that we were all facing, such as those arising from remote work, cybersecurity, managing staff virtually, to name just a few. We are so grateful for your responsiveness. Additionally, our Southwest Indiana Small Business Development Center, which has always been such an important partner to our business community, became literally even more critical through these months. I think we host the best SBDC in the state, and their outcomes confirm my opinion. Here are just a few stats that I wanna share with you. So during this period, 30 new businesses started, I mean, during a pandemic year. 2,564 jobs that have been added or secured, 459 business clients that have been assisted and collectively have invested $10 million in their businesses, again, in a pandemic, yeah. <clears throat> and this year, because the federal disaster programs have been managed primarily through the Small Business Administration, an additional $6.3 million in disaster-related capital funding was approved through our offices. So when I stepped into this role as chair of the chamber two years ago, I spoke to you about regionalism and about the opportunity for the chamber to grow and change to better support and truly be a catalyst for regional prosperity. So then I envisioned standing here tonight, announcing some tangible wins. And I am here to do so, uh, but just not the ones I had envisioned. <laughs> so yes, we have enabled the Chamber Foundation to serve community and quality of place priorities. Yes, we have modernized our governance. And we've certainly had some great marketing awards, and all that is good. We have proven that we can both lead in our community and our region and respond with impact when unexpected challenges come at us. And yes, the I-69 bridge remains our number one priority. Yes, yes. But I'd argue uh, that the real wins and the, as I would phrase it, the tangible stakes in the ground of progress these past two years have been in the culture that we've built. First, this chamber is now squarely in the business of advancing regional prosperity and equity for all. For member businesses, for yet to participate businesses, for every individual that calls this region home. We are committed to 100% participation in our economy by everyone. By those who have been economically disadvantaged, by those who are new to this country, by black Americans that have faced systemic discrimination. E will stand for everyone's part in our future. And this chamber has the great good fortune to be supported by members and stakeholders who support equity without reservation. Second, we have become committed to aligned and deliberate progress and growth for our region. We have a really bright future. For those of us who are from this area or who have moved here from elsewhere and now call it home, we have long appreciated that our region has a multitude of blessings and benefits. I believe that the, des the desirability of our region, of our location for lots of people, including those who possibly are experiencing the impacts of COVID-19 in bigger, more congested parts of this country, 
it's going to be even more comp evident and compelling as, as we, they look at our businesses, families, and individuals, excuse me, as businesses, families, and individuals look at our industry assets, our job opportunities, our great universities, our logistics advantages, and our favorable cost of living. So, where are we today? Yes, we are facing a new normal. Indeed, we are living in that new normal right now. Some impacts will be temporary, and we will return to some aspects of business and life as we knew it back in February. And we've seen that even some segments of our economy are back to almost normal or near normal operations right now. Yet our restaurants, restaurants, our retailers, our hospitality and entertainment sectors are still deeply impacted and will be for the foreseeable future. Education at all levels is pivoting and adjusting on a daily basis. Likely, remote work is here to stay. Virtual meet, meetings are certainly going to be a way we do business for some time to come. Air service, critical to a high value business region, is just starting to revive. So, while we are not out of the woods, this is what I believe. We are recovering. We are on a strong path restoring our, our community, our region, and our businesses. And we will absolutely, absolutely, come out of this experience rethinking the ways we work and live and being stronger and better. We are growing our region. We are going to prosper as an equitable and an inclusive community that opens access to our economy, to all. We are going to continue to participate in a global economy because this chamber, of which each of us is a part, will continue to advocate for the change that moves us towards these goals and we will do it together with every like-minded organization and individual and with each of you. In closing, let me say, it's been an honor to serve as your chamber chair these last two years. Thank you. Yes, I'm going to give her something nice. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Tara Barney, and it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. And Christine, I don't know of enough ways to thank you. Many of you know I'm, I'm two and a half years into town, and uh, this woman not only um, found me, razzle-dazzled me with this community, um, made it seem like the most perfect place in the world to, to, to continue my career, and it's been a a joy to not only see her as a friend and colleague, a neighbor, she and Jim, um, a fellow dog lover, but um, in all sub substance, this is a woman that leads with grace and an iron will both. And she is deeply focused on targeted goals, let me tell you. <laughs> when Christine decides we're gonna go somewhere, we've gone there. And it's been a joy to uh, have a chance to execute with her. So I've got a little gift for her tonight, and then we'll get on with the program. I have a fun gift for her later, but... <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness, um, I don't know, Kurt Begley, how you're going to follow this woman, but I'm counting on you to do a great job. <laughs> Thank you for being with us tonight, Christine. And I'm also pleased to announce, while this woman's leaving the stage, that she doesn't get off so easily because she will follow Jim Sangren as chair of the Chamber Foundation. Jim has been a terrific leader of our foundation, and by sheer will and personality, he's made the foundation key to delivering services to our organization. So we're looking forward to working with Christine in that role going forward. The Chamber Foundation invests in our region's future 
by supporting career and workforce development opportunities for high school students and young professionals, and by investing in quality of place and in economic development initiatives, we are ensuring that our region evolves into an exciting and welcoming place in the next generation. This year, the Chamber Foundation has elected to recognize the voluntary work of our first responders, particularly the fire and police departments that have made guns and hoses a treasured community battle. One that in other years has raised a lot of money for 911 Gives Hope. Help me welcome Chief Mike Conley, Chief Billy Bolin, and Sheriff Dave Wedding to the stage. And I don't know what's coming, but it's gonna be interesting. <laughs> I believe for the past 12 years, members of the Evansville Fire Department, the Police Department, Sheriff's Office, and EMS have fought bloody battles here in this Ford Center and the first event at the Coliseum in an effort to raise money for people in our community that are underprivileged. And it's been an honor to be part of that with Chief Bolin and Chief Conley. And because we can't have the fights to this year in this beautiful facility, we thought we would let Chief Conley and Chief Bolin spar a little bit here on stage today. All right. <laughs> See, I was told we're supposed to prepare how we normally do, so I'm eating my donuts. <laughs> he, he was supposed to be in his lazy boy, but I'm out in Roberts Park the other day and I see him out there running, getting prepared for this. So I, I did wear my Batman belt. <laughs> I've got my tools if needed, Mike. I'm not fighting fair, you're bigger than I am. And I got reach. <laughs> so on, on a serious note, how many of you in here have ever been to Guns and Hoses before? So quite a few, thank you very much. Um, we started, as, as Dave said, at the Coliseum about 13 years ago. We didn't really know what to expect. The idea was to raise money for people with special needs and children. And the very first event at the Coliseum uh, the sheriff actually was chief deputy. He volunteered at the front door, worked it. He's helped every year since. Um, chief Connolly has actually fought in our event. Um, as we joke, I would not want to fight him. He's, he's a, a very infit, strong man. Um, but anyway, uh, we did it at the Coliseum. We moved to Roberts Stadium. And then we've been here at the Ford Center since it opened. And my goal has been to sell this place out. And if you haven't been here, at Guns and Hoses, we have the upper deck open um, last year, we were about 600 seats away from a sellout. And this year, um, before we had to cancel, we were about 800 seats ahead of day-to-day -day sales. So I think we were on our way to our first sellout that we didn't get to have. Um, they mentioned Concept Sound and Light. Mark, you, they do our event every year. They're phenomenal. So you guys, thank you very much for all your help over the years. But, but anyway, we raise around 120 to 130,000 a year. All of our money goes to um, local charities and individuals, and the, the criteria is you have to be um, somebody with special needs or an organization that helps people with special needs or an organization that helps children. Um, we've helped about every organization you could think of here in town over the years. Boys and Girls Club, Youth Resources, um, the uh, Ronald McDonald House. We committed 175,000 to them over five years. We were supposed to give them 35,000 this year. Obviously, we couldn't do that because we didn't have the event. So if any of you would like to donate, we don't have anybody on our uh, board that's paid. We're 100% volunteer. All the money goes back into the community. Guns and Hoses is our only fundraiser. The other thing we do every year is the first weekend in December, we have a toy drive out at the east side Walmart. Uh, we typically fill up a whole semi-trailer full of toys, and they're distributed to all the local hospitals. So over the past 10 years, if you've had a kid or a relative in a hospital that's been given a toy while they're in there, it probably came from that toy drive. So first weekend of December, we'd appreciate any help you could give there. And if, if you're so inclined to donate, that money will reach uh, somebody in the community to help kids in special needs. So thank you so much for, for helping us out today.
Hi, good evening. My name is Steve Greenlee. I am Senior Vice President of Generation Development at Centerpoint Energy. Christine talked a little bit about what her day job was. My day job is to do what Christine tells me most of the time uh, in our office, along with all of the other folks from our company that are in this room. But most importantly, uh, I'm here uh, to introduce our keynote speaker, Battalion Chief David Morkel. Uh, he is a 30-year veteran with the Fire Department of New York, promoted to lieutenant the week after the World Trade Center attacks. Chief Morkel has taken every opportunity to study leadership and enhance his leadership knowledge. He's a graduate of the Fire Department of New York's Fire Officers Management Institute, Advanced Leadership Course, West Point Combating Terrorism Leadership Program, and a whole host of other, um, I just really long to list accomplishments, frankly. Um, he's been activated with the team for Hurricane Gustav in Louisiana, Hurricane Irene in both New York City and Binghamton, New York, Hurricane Sandy in New York City, the snowstorm in Buffalo, the East Harlem explosion and collapse, several wild land fires in the Southwest, and other incident management teams. In a year like 2020, I think we want this man in the room with us, frankly. You can tell when everyone is asking folks to leave, my man shows up, right? That kind of guy. Currently, Chief Morkel is the executive officer to the chief of operations at headquarters. Born in London, England, he lived in California, New Hampshire, Texas, and Michigan before settling in Indiana as an Air Force brat when he was 10. He has a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in theater from the University of Evansville. And prior, prior to joining the fire department, he worked in technical theater across the country and taught at the University of Evansville and Western Michigan University. The dude in the Dos Equis commercials may play the most interesting man in the world, and he might be the most interesting man in the world. Although Indiana has a special place in his heart, he now calls New York home. He's lived in Westchester for the past 26 years with his wife of 34 years and has two adult children. I'm a new resident to Southwest Indiana as of today. So if you all would join me in welcoming David Morkel back to Evansville, let's give him a warm Southwest Indiana welcome. Thank you so much. I'm not nervous, I'm not nervous, I'm not nervous. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. Um, my wife was gonna travel out here with me, but she decided that it was best for her to stay home, otherwise she would be sitting down there shaking her head and saying, well, there's no living with him anymore. <laughs> it's really good, good to be back in Evansville. Um, you know, two floors of fire on the 30, uh, 30th and 31st floor of a high-rise apartment building, and this is what makes me nervous. <laughs> Before I get started, I want to thank a few people. Um, Mayor Lloyd Winicky and his wife, Carol, um, Abigail Whirling, Eric Rentschler, and the other faculty, staff, and students at the University of Evansville. The staff at uh, Tropicana, President Christopher Petruskevich, Tara Barney, Christine Keck, I'm glad you cried so I don't have to, Kurt Begel, Dr. David Smith, Karen Robinson, Vicki Schmidt, and of course I want to thank the Chief Mike Connolly and the Evansville Fire Department who keep you safe 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Let's give them a big hand. So yesterday I had a interview with President P and it was, you know, so I, I get there and, I'm, and I go up and I said, you know, Mr. President, just tell me how to pronounce your name again. And he looked at me with a confused look on his face and he went, Chris. <laughs> I 
So as I was thinking about what I would talk about tonight, the lyrics of the song by the Talking Heads kept coming to my mind. Is this my beautiful life? Is this my beautiful wife? How did I get here? Well, over the next two hours, I'm going to tell you a story of how I got here. OK, 15 minutes. I'm going to give you the abridged version and the Cliff Notes version. And just so we're clear about the difference between the two, the way I look at it, the abridged version has the highlights, and the Cliff Notes version has the important parts. <clears throat> when I was a sophomore at Maconaqua High School in Kokomo, I tried football and wrestling. Now, at 105 pounds and getting knocked out by the tacklematic, football probably wasn't going to be good. And I only had to lose a couple pounds for wrestling, so wrestling it was. One day we were taking a break during practice and we went into the cafeteria where they were having auditions for the school play. While we were sitting in the back commenting amongst ourselves, the director and drama teacher turned to us and said, if you're in here, you're auditioning and made us get up and audition. So up I went, and the next day I had four bit parts in the play. That was the beginning of my theater career. And I am still friends with that high school drama teacher, Kathy Reardon. She is a native of Evansville, and when I was thinking about going to college to study theater, she said, without question, go to the University of Evansville. So that is the only college that I applied to, and thankfully they didn't have as selective a, a, an acceptance policy back then as they do now, because I'm not sure I would have made it. My freshman year, I worked in the shop, in the scene shop as part of one of my classes, and within a few months, the technical director, Todd Engel, asked if I was interested in a paid assistantship they were going to pay me to do the same thing I was doing already. I had to think about that for about two seconds, and that was the beginning of my transition from acting to technical theater. I'm sure John Lutz and Dudley Thomas were very relieved. The next year, they hired a new set designer who would also change my life. Joe Flauto came in and for some reason felt that I had some talent or potential and he, without doubt, became a mentor for my journey through the rest of college. We then became colleagues and friends and remain friends to this day. Evansville continued to be a part of my life after graduation. After a year of graduate school, I returned to be the technical director and set designer for the Evansville Civic Theater and then came back to teach at U of E for a year. Joe Flauto intervened in my life again when I had a less than stellar interview with the artistic director of the Hope Summer Repertory Theater in Holland, Michigan. And he had to assure her that I could do the job and I would be a good choice. And that enabled me to meet the person that would change my life forever. My second summer there, I met my would-be wife, now for 34 years, with two adult children. Her recollection is a little different than mine. But she says I walked over to the table that she was at in order to talk to another woman who really had no interest in talking to me. So I ended up talking with Kathy, and someday I'll have to thank that other woman. So anyhow, my wife was from New Jersey and had gone to NYU for undergrad and still had an apartment in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. So we moved to New York to continue to do theater and I worked at various theaters around the city including the New York Shakespeare Festival in Central Park, second stage on the Upper West Side and landed a steady job at a small scene shop in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Then one day, 
in February of 1987, after we'd moved to Queens to a larger apartment, an apartment without the shower next to the kitchen sink, with a full bathroom and a separate bedroom, there was a manhole fire in the street in front of our apartment at about 9 o'clock at night. The fire department showed up, as they usually do, checked all the surrounding properties, put in a call for the utility company to respond, and when things quieted down a bit, they left, leaving one firefighter to monitor the situation until the utility company showed up. So it's about 10 degrees out on a February night, and this firefighter is standing outside, keeping an eye on a manhole, waiting for the utility company to show up. Not being one to miss an opportunity to talk to someone, I went out and asked, what's going on? And if, I, if he would like a cup of coffee or something. Sure, he says. So, I make some coffee, head out, and he's telling me about the job. Now, he's the bop which is their term for the junior firefighter. He used to be an accountant for Hasbro Toys before he got hired, and he loves being a firefighter. He also tells me that the application for the next test to become a firefighter is that two weeks. And you had to apply before your 29th birthday. And the test is only given once every four years. I was 28. Now, I didn't know anything about being a firefighter. I didn't grow up thinking, I want to be a firefighter. But I did know that my experience with doing theater from the University of Evansville was different than doing theater in New York. As a technical director at Evansville, I was part of the process of deciding what we wanted to say and what we wanted the audience to experience. Truly a part of the process of how we would affect society. In New York, I wasn't part of that process. I was a carpenter getting paid $10 an hour, working 50 to 60 hours a week. I think I was looking for a change and a way to affect society again. The next day, I pulled out the New York City telephone book, looked through the, yellow, the blue pages, looking for, the, for a number for the New York City Fire Department. Now remember, this is 1987, the time before the internet, in New York. And the idea of being able to call any agency in the city and actually get an answer was pretty slim. So I prepared myself for a long morning, expecting the phone to keep ringing or to be transferred multiple times. I dialed the number, and a guy picks up on the second ring. He asked, he asked how he can help me. And I tell him, I'm looking for an application for the firefighter's test. He says, and get this, What's your address? I'll mail it to you. <laughs> right. Well, he did, and I got it in the mail, filled it out, sent it in. I hang on to that phone number like it's a winning lottery ticket, and I would call up every once in a while and see if there's any news on the test. Well, one time, whoever answers the phone tells me that whatever we know will be in the chief newspaper. And that's the civil service newspaper. It comes out once a week. Great. So I go up to the newsstand, pick up the chief, which came out the day before, check it out. Nothing about the test. But on the back page is a small ad for a preparation class for the FDNY firefighters written test. And it starts that night in Queens. Hmm. So off I went in the first class, and at the first class, the retired chief that was teaching the class said to do two things to prepare for the test. 
read anything, and start running. So that was the real beginning of reading for me. Now, I certainly read when I was supposed to, but I would not have called myself a reader until then. Well, three-ish years later, I got a call and was sworn into the FDNY in August of 1990. And everything was going along fairly routinely until one sunny day in September of 2001. When I was in New Jersey finishing up installing a sliding glass door for my father-in-law, when I found out about the World Trade Centers while we were at a lumber yard. When I got back in a car, I heard the recall on the radio. A long day and night and lots of changes over the next few days included a call on Friday night that I was getting promoted to lieutenant on Sunday. It was originally planned as a private ceremony, no family, no friends. But when I showed up on Sunday morning, it was changed to not only a public ceremony, but a nationally televised event. It was too late to have my wife and two small children travel to Brooklyn, and it wasn't going to be the celebration that usually happens with promotions. So they didn't attend, but I did call a couple of Evansville alumni who lived in Brooklyn. John Creech and Susan Knott lived there, and they came and showed up for the promotion ceremony. There were several speeches at the ceremony, and one thing that was said was that we were the future of the FDNY, that we would rebuild the department. Well, I took that to heart, and for the past 19 years, I have done what I could to meet that expectation. After some time down at the Trade Center, I ended up at a firehouse on the Lower East Side of Manhattan and learned a lot from, the, from some great senior firefighters. And a couple of years later, I got promoted to captain. And after a year or so covering different firehouses, I was assigned to the Lion's Den, Engine 23 in Midtown Manhattan. I remember one of my first fires while I was at Engine 23. It was, in, it was the middle of the afternoon, and we were assigned to a fire on, a fi on 57th Street in a hotel on the east side. The fire was reported on the 16th floor, and we were supposed to be the second engine in. As we were responding, we were getting several reports about the fire, and that the first two engine was going to be delayed. So we got into the address first, and as I walked into the lobby, I noticed there didn't seem to be any lights. We went to the elevator, and lo and behold, the elevators weren't working. It seemed they didn't have any, any power in the building at all. So we started to walk up 16 floors with all our gear, and luckily on the 12th floor, we had to cross over to another stairs where the standpipe would be for us to hook up the fire hose to put the fire out. This gave us a little break, but when I rounded the last flight of stairs, I could see the fire under the door and the door was blistering from the heat. Well, now it's time to go to work. The walk up had played havoc with the other firefighters who were carrying the bulk of the equipment. And I had to piece together enough firefighters from different companies to get the first hand line in operation. We had a whole floor of fire on the 16th floor due to construction, but things went pretty smooth from that point on. This was the first fire I had had with the chief that was working that day. And years later, when I was a battalion chief in the Lower East Side, that chief had been promoted to the chief of the fire academy. And he called me up to see if I would be the chief of probationary firefighter school. The timing was right, and we had developed a great working relationship and respect for each other. So I worked my last day in the firehouse and started my administrative years. I ran proby school for two years, 
and when his, was in charge of training over 1,200 firefighters in those two years. Jim, the chief, got promoted again to the chief of training, and he asked me to be his executive officer, which I, of course, said yes to. In less than a year, he was injured while working at a large fire, and a new chief of training was appointed. Now, I had a short relationship with Tom prior to him being promoted to chief of training. And when he took over, he immediately turned to me and said, you're not going anywhere. You're staying with me. OK. Well, things were changing rapidly in the upper management of the department right then. And Tom was quickly promoted to the chief of operations. And he informed me then that I was going to headquarters with him. We had a great team, and our relationship was based on trust and respect. So that's the abridged version of how I got to where I am with the FDNY as the executive officer to the chief of operations from a small town in north central Indiana, a journey that Evansville plays a very large part of. But I wouldn't be here if it had not been for the people that have impacted and guided my life over the years. It may seem more like a pinball machine without any clear understanding of how the impact of each person or bumper guides our lives. But had one person not fulfilled their part in the story of my life, I would not be, at this point, talking to you about a story that seems truly blessed and unbelievable. Had Kathy Reardon not made us get up and audition, I would never have experienced my love for theater. Had she not been from Evansville, I would not have met Joe. Had he not been the teacher, mentor, and friend that he is, I may not have landed that job at Hope Summer Repertory Theater and never met my wife, who had an apartment in New York City. A stranger on a phone, a firefighter in the cold, a life-changing attack, and a focus on being an intentional student of leadership that caught the attention of other leaders. I am who I am because the people that I have met and the way they have interacted with me. The Cliff Notes version of how I got here would probably go like this. Kathy, Joe, John, Dudley, Mary, Julie, Lori, Rick, Teresa, Beth, John, the Evansville bank teller with $5 when my car was out of gas and the check bounced. Stranger on the phone, woman who wasn't interested, Dee Dee, Eileen, Joan, Dave, Jim, Tom, Paul, Brenda, Warren, Leslie, Chris, JJ, Saul, Mike, Dennis, Brian, Rachel, Paul, Jack, Jim, Kathy, Sam, and Peregrine. Will I be listed in the Cliff Notes version of other people's journeys? I don't know. If I am, will it be said with a smile or a frown? I can hope. Will you be in the Cliff Notes of someone's journey? How will you be remembered? Your choice. However you are remembered, you have an impact on people's lives. Whether it's good or bad is up to you. It may be a little or it may be a lot, but every interaction will change the course of someone's life. How do you want to change someone's life today? How does this organization want to change someone's life tomorrow? Thank you for listening. Thank you for being a part of my journey 
and helping define who I will be tomorrow. Stay safe, stay healthy, and hug the ones you can. Boy, good evening, I'm Tara Barney. I'm your Southwest Indiana Chamber CEO. What a conversation that was, Chief. Thank you so much for being with us. And I look around this room and uh, I have so many friends and you know, you, you've given me something to think about, sir. So may I ask you all to give him one more round of applause for being with us tonight. It is great to be here with you all this evening. All of you here and all of you out there. If we were holding this event Saturday night, 250 more of you that are out there could actually be in here. But it is what it is. <laughs> Seriously, we've gone to great lengths to ensure that all of us participating tonight can do so safely. And we will continue to get this economy open as quickly and safely as possible. But this is the perfect time for me to take just a second and extend my sincere thanks to the chamber staff for the very cool stage decor, the horses, the dogs, the, f the fire engine, the mayor, the fire department, the police, the sheriff. You've all been extraordinary about helping us because we had an idea that the most obvious people to talk about tonight were the first responders. So thank you for making this a very special evening for all of us. And Mayor, and I've got, just got to say, uh, you and Steve Schaefer have done an extraordinary job of leading all of we uh, partner organizations and how we take care of this community over the past few months. So thank you so much for that leadership. If you want to really show some appreciation, get this out. Because one way to do that would be to, to uh, follow on uh, Billy Bowen's uh, challenge and uh, help support our community. And Guns and Hoses will be back, I promise. Uh, but we would love it if you made a donation. So seriously, when out-of-towners come to this community for the Corn Ferry Tour at Victoria in Warwick County, for the Ohio Valley Conference Basketball Tournament, which, fingers crossed, will happen right here, the reaction is the same. Impressive. And when Chief Morkel and returns for another chamber annual meeting, uh, when their class reunions, when students enroll at the Stone Family Center for Health Sciences, or when corporate prof professionals come to town for business meetings, how often have you heard the comment, I can't believe how much the Evansville region has changed. There is so much going on here. We are rich in talent, in unique assets, in a culture, a vibe that energizes the way we do business the way we support our citizenry, and the way we choose to live. We really are poised for great success. A remarkable transformation has taken place in this past decade, and it's marked by a shift in mindset that positions our region for additional gains in the coming decade. One of the drivers of this change is the chamber. We are regional, we are business-led, we are an organization committed to growing this economy throughout this tri-state region. And we're very proud to have a hand in shaping this community's priorities and in focusing resources to achieve more and to do it faster. As we find ourselves marking seven months into the COVID-19 pandemic and living and working so differently, I am reminded every day to choose my attitude and to look for opportunity. I miss connecting very much. And I'm excited for the future when I can leave my mask off, when I can hug my friends, and when I can act on some of the plans that we've been hard at work before the pandemic came to our door. A year ago, we had no idea that the worldwide pandemic would force us to adapt and to respond to our region's needs in ways we had not previously imagined. Fortunately, we've had the infrastructure, the talent, the first responders, the healthcare systems that continue to guide us through these unprecedented times. These months have inspired us to imagine a future that will be different. And as president and CEO, I am excited because I know we will be better when we emerge from all that this year has brought. 
A colleague reminded me recently, you don't fail when you don't quit. So we're not quitting. Where are we headed? As one of the state's largest chambers, we are very well positioned to facilitate business, government, nonprofits, academic institutions, our residents with shared purpose, all to align to be one region with one vision. We do strive to provide the best business climate in this country, and we are determined to be a premier region for people, jobs, and investment. My personal vision for us is not so much about having more, it's about having better. The ideal business climate is a balance between quality of living and quality of working. It's a community with abundant talent and encouraging of diversity. We are building a region that helps citizens fit in because of talent and not be left out because of difference. Typically, tonight is a time to recognize a small business that has a special story, a unique success. This year, with the greatest possible respect, the Chamber is honored to recognize our small business community. Every one of the restaurants, the clubs, the retailers, the service providers that came to terms with the COVID-19 body blows made nearly impossible decisions and now they're finding their way back. In our estimation, they are this region's best small business of the year. You've shown us courage, resilience, loyalty, and brilliance. Small business is the heart and soul of our community, and we thank you for battling for your future and your customers. Let's give a hand to our small business community. Now, I want to take just a minute for two stories. One is about innovation, a nonprofit entity that played the long game and built a unique business model that this year in particular has proven its value in its capacity to deliver extraordinary service and scalable service, and service that many would say has been the difference in our region's ability to navigate the pandemic that we are experiencing. We asked you to share your opinions on leaders who engendered your trust, earned your confidence, and personally engaged in defining the culture of their organization. And again, in this year of exception, we came upon a powerful story of a team of executives who built a durable and innovative partnership that positioned them and their team to deliver confidence and clarity to this community as we struggled to understand how to protect our families and our businesses in this pandemic. This year, the Southwest Indian Chamber of Commerce recognizes the Distinguished Business Leader Team of the Year. Ron and James, congratulations on this great recognition. Uh, you, you know, we're, in Evansville, we're blessed to have great quality health care. And I think about the leadership in our healthcare industry in Evansville, and I think of two stellar leaders in Sean and James. I'm thinking back over what our community, what our world has been through these last many months. And I'm so grateful that I've been able to rely on Sean and James in all the decisions I've had to help make to lead our community. Your stewardship of our public health has been amazing. Your guidance has been so phenomenal. Couldn't be more grateful for your leadership, what you've done, not only for uh, our community, but for our region. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, we appreciate your good work and all that you and your teams have done at Deaconess. It is my honor and privilege to help recognize Sean McCoy as the Southwest Indiana Chamber of Commerce Distinguished Business Leader of the Year. Sean and I became vice presidents at Deaconess over 18 years ago, only six months apart. And I can't tell you what a great ride it has been. I've so enjoyed the opportunity and the privilege to work shoulder to shoulder with a man that I admire and respect and also consider a close friend. Sean has an uncanny ability to analyze complex situations and formulate great ideas. I consider Sean a thinker, but very specifically, Sean's a fast thinker. And working with someone like him really keeps you on your toes and challenges us as a leadership team to perform at our best every day. Deaconess is blessed with a great board of directors and an incredible team of doctors, nurses, and almost 8,000 employees serving the tri-state. We're so proud of our team 
and how they've risen to the occasion of this unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic. I'd like to end by saying what a privilege it is to work with this amazing team and to see the dedication and commitment of the entire Deaconess organization. Sean, you have a great leadership team and you're a great leader. And I'm so happy and privileged to be able to say congratulations, my friend. I can't think of anyone who deserves this award more. So I'm so excited uh, to be here today to congratulate Dr. James Porter for the honor of being selected by the Southwest Indiana Chamber Distinguished Business Person of the Year. Congratulations, James. He started here as a hospitalist uh, back in the year 2000. About two years after that, he moved into a management role. And that's really where I got to know James and really started to build a relationship with him. You know, we're a similar age, similar background. And so we had a connection right away, almost as if we were long lost brothers. In 2017, uh, Linda White uh, retired, and as you know, those are big shoes to fill. And we created a new role, the president role, which James filled at that point in time. And uh, we didn't really know exactly how it was going to work, but we did know one thing. We both had similar visions for the company, where we wanted it to head, what we wanted it to look like in the community. And to this day, we still have that same vision. Well, then in March of this year, you know, this little thing called COVID shows up. This was really in James's wheelhouse. He's internal medicine pediatric physician by background. Really, he immediately took the lead on our COVID response uh, for our community. I know both James and I are extremely proud of our team here at Deaconess. This honor uh, really is representative of those folks' hard work and effort uh, over this past year and really representative of Deaconess as a company. We decided early on as a management team that COVID was not gonna be an excuse. It wasn't gonna be, well, we didn't do this because of COVID. Despite COVID this year, uh, we've brought on three new hospitals under the Deaconess umbrella. That's Henderson County and Union County in Kentucky and also Gibson County in Indiana. Those hospitals are now under the Deaconess umbrella. Also, our quality folks uh, continue to do great work again being recognized number two in the state of Indiana for the third year in a row. With that, uh, on behalf of our board of directors and our management team, we're so proud of our 8,000 employees and what they do every day to bring Deaconess to the forefront and serve our community. If I was to ask you what words come to mind when you hear the words Deaconess Health, I bet some of you would think about Deaconess in a variety of facilities and a variety of locations, such as Midtown, Gateway, Darmstadt, the new Deaconess Clinic. And I bet some of you would think about such entities as the Deaconess Sports Park, the Deaconess Aquatic Center that's under construction. And I bet several of you would think about Deaconess and the way Deaconess has served the community throughout this pandemic. And all of you are correct. Deaconess does represent facilities in a variety of locations, a variety of services, and patient care. But we are here tonight to recognize Deaconess for its leadership. Its leadership in its board activities, leadership at the service level, leadership in taking calculated risk. It's everything wrapped up together. And all of this is under the leadership of Sean McCoy and Dr. James Porter, our honorees tonight. It is about people, about people fulfilling the Deaconess mission to advance the health and well being of the people we serve. Let me be one of the first to congratulate Sean, James, Lynn, Sharona, Cheryl, Jared, and Alan. Way to go, you're the best. Please join me in welcoming Sean McCoy and Dr. James Porter to the stage. So I don't know if you noticed in the pictures, that's a, that was a good look, but James used to have hair on top of his head and I didn't have any down here. So I have hair and took his hair from the top of his head. So, um, but you know, I want to say, and I know James feels this way also, this is not an award about individuals. This is an award about the team. This is about Deaconess and about the senior admin team that's out there in those seats tonight. So uh, really congratulations to all of you. You've made this happen for us here. So thanks.
And I'll just echo those words. We did look a lot younger back then. A few gray hairs and a lot less hair for me. Um, it is a privilege uh, to stand here on behalf of um, 8,000 wonderful caregivers who step up every day uh, in our community to provide world-class patient care uh, in the midst of unprecedented and some of the most challenging times we've ever faced in American health care. Uh, it causes us great pride to come to work every day and to see the dedication that our employees uh, embody. We stand on the shoulders of great leaders who positioned our organization to be the leader in patient care in the region and one of the top health systems in the state. And we stand shoulder to shoulder every day with a great management team many are, who are here tonight and Linda named and our 8,000 employees uh, who are dedicated in ways that uh, truly do inspire us. So on behalf of all those folks, we thank the chamber for this recognition and uh, are happy to accept this on their behalf. Thank you. Now, there's this uh, business of the year opportunity to talk tonight. Uh, we do want to recognize the business of the year. This is a story that's written itself over these months of COVID. It's about a business that we know as an anchor in our community. It's a homegrown business, one that each of us interacts with daily. A business that is changing the world we live in constantly one that demonstrates its generous and civic-minded culture this year in extraordinary ways by stepping into the personal protective equipment supply gaps around the world and here, by pivoting at the start of the COVID crisis worldwide and here. This Fortune 300 company truly demonstrated that being a world leader in the industry is not only good for shareholders, but means everything to us here. When the worldwide need was great, this company delivered to communities around the world. But first, they delivered to us, their hometown. Let's learn more. It's first and foremost been amazing that our business in the midst of a global pandemic has continued to operate as an essential business. Obviously, I accept an award on behalf of our 47,000 employees around the world. We are all about simply operating our business and you know, doing what we've done for the last 53 plus years as an Evansville-based company. There was many definitions of what essential was. And for one, I think everybody can agree that uh, the safety and health and well-being of the human race was a, a very big priority. What creative things can we uh, contribute in terms of keeping patients and employees safe within the health systems? We had to shift much of our production toward healthcare products. Our people around the world have continued to deliver above expectations to our customers in the midst of a global pandemic, continuing to provide essential products and services, you know, while at the same time venturing out and producing products that frankly we had never made before. Surgical masks, face shields, and ultimately, you know, doing that on a global basis. For us, it was our responsibility to do what we could to live up to the expectations that we have in this region for each other. And so it is an honor, it is humbling, and uh, on behalf of all the very employees, not only here locally, but throughout the globe, thank you for the recognition and we'll continue to fight the good fight. With over 2,000 employees in the local area, obviously Barry's an important company in this, in this region. Uh, that's 2,000 of 47,000 employees that we have around the world, uh, each committed and dedicated to providing these essential products during what has been an unprecedented period of COVID-19. Those are the people that make the difference for our company. They make a difference in the communities they reside, they make a difference to our end customers around the world, and we couldn't be prouder of the contributions that they've made for our company's success. Please welcome the new chair of the board of the directors, but most important, the director, the division president for Barry Global, Kurt Begley. Congratulations. Yes, yes, keep it going. Do you guys feel like we need to, when you're watching baseball on TV and they have the uh, animation going and you hear the, the crowd in the background, I feel like we need that tonight. Uh, but it is, 
it's quite an honor to sit, stand here today uh, on behalf of Tom Salmon, our chairman and CEO. Unfortunately, uh, he had a last minute conflict and asked that I receive the award tonight on behalf of all of our employees at Berry Global. Um, and he definitely sends his regards. As you all know, Tom is a very uh, energetic and competitive, passionate person uh, that's been a blessing for this community and we're fortunate to have him lead us uh, in, in these uncertain times. You know, it's my responsibility tonight to close, and, and this is interesting timing. Yeah, but first, before we do that, I'm gonna accept the award on, on behalf of Barry. We have some of our Barry folks here tonight, and I appreciate all the work that, that they put in every day. We've had great leaders inside of the company uh, that have been homegrown, some that have been transplanted. Uh, but as Chief Morkel was walking through, sharing some of his stories last night, at dinner and, and then again tonight with all of us, he talked about people and, and you can hear you know, the, the, the passion that he had and, and the appreciation that he has for people that guide him, that guided him and impacted him throughout his life. Uh, our former CEO, uh, Ira Boots, uh, was one of the, the greatest mentors of my life uh, and continues to have a great deal of presence here locally, but also on, on a worldwide basis with other things that he's involved in. And he gave us the lesson of 35 decisions. In your life, on average, the, the individual, an individual person will make 35 choices throughout their life that will put them on different paths of what they're going to accomplish. And I thought it was quite appropriate, as you talked about all the people that impacted you, it was also the decisions that you made. Your decision to come to Evansville may have been influenced by somebody else, but that was one step and many steps to make you who you are. And we are so blessed again to have you with us tonight, uh, to have your leadership. And I know the state of New York, the city of New York City uh, is very blessed to have you. And you're always welcome back here in the city of Evansville. So thank you. So before I get to my closing comments uh, for the chamber duties, I do again want to thank the chamber uh, I did abstain from voting here, by the way, um, but it is, uh, it's an honor to get these type of recognitions and these awards. There's so many, so many businesses that are deserving of this award every year, and it's always humbling to stand in front of a group like this and accept it on behalf of close to 50,000 employees and, and over 2,000 employees here locally. So thank you, Tara, and, and thank you to all of those who voted Barry for Business of the Year. Okay. All right, good. Now to conclude the evening. So, you know, you, you meet different people throughout your life. And as I explained earlier, I, I had an opportunity to spend time with uh, David Morkel last night. And there was many familiarities and many similarities that you always find with people. And you admire leaders and you admire a journey that someone takes and you learn from history. Uh, and then you find connections. My mother was an Air Force brat, born in Florida, lived in Texas, lived in Guam, lived in Spain, and somehow made her way back to her roots in, in Ferdinand, Indiana, where she met, her, met my father and, and uh, graduated from the Deaconess School of Nursing, worked in ER for 18 years. My wife, Kelly, her grandfather, Bill, retired fire chief here in the city of Evansville, business entrepreneur after that. The characteristics of people that are so selfless and humble and maybe a little bit of adrenaline junkies, it takes a special person and a unique characteristic to be able to put themselves in harm's way and not always get thanked. And that's one thing that we continue to do tonight and I, I hope that our police department, our sheriff department, our fire department, EMS, all of those volunteers, really, you're getting, you're, you're working. That's part of what you do, but you were called to it. And you decide every day to step up and put yourself in harm's way for all of us citizens that count on you. And so thank you for all of your work and dedication to all of us. Thank you. I do want to take a moment and, and again, recognize Tara 
and the entire chamber staff to pull off a meeting when we didn't think we were going to be able to have a meeting. The fact that we're here tonight is a lot of hard work from the entire group. Karen, Chandra, the, Vicki, Tara, the entire team. Thank you guys for a great meeting. <laughs> Next year is going to be incredible. We're going to fill this stadium up or we're going to maybe shoot some hoops. I don't know. We'll have a basketball court out here. Uh, Tara and team from a, a creativity and a collaborative work uh, throughout the entire year, jumping on board early and finding ways to ask the mayor, how can we help? And then rallying the troops, getting all the people that we needed involved. If you wanted help, you could get help. If you wanted information, it was provided to you. And so there was great work throughout the year. Fantastic. I'm going to shift over to Christine. And I'm not going to cry, Christine, but because you are important to me. But as long as I don't talk about my wife, I won't cry. I'm not going to talk about you, hon. Uh, Christine, the last two years, you know, you and I didn't have really know each other until we got involved in the chamber. And I can tell you, as, as Tara explained earlier, this is a woman that is highly competitive, extremely passionate, very thoughtful and very deliberate in her leadership style and her management and her drive and her commitment to this community to move us forward. So Christine, it's been a heck, of a, a heck of a learning experience for me and I'm humbled to have had the opportunity to work with you and now have the opportunity to try to fill those very high heels uh, as I step into this, this new role. So one, one more round of applause for Christine, please. So you hear honor, you hear duty, you hear a lot of things. You think of those words when we talk about the fire department, when we talk about the police department, the sheriff's office, EMS, our first responders, the military, whatever it may be, everybody has a tremendous responsibility as a citizen of this country, as a citizen of this community to help move it forward. And that's what makes our community so unique. And that's why this responsibility is never taken lightly. And when you think about all the people that have been in this role before me now, yes, they are big shoes to fill, but the great thing about it is they're a phone call away and they're always willing to jump for support. And so we will continue to act and we will double down on driving teamwork, unified teamwork amongst all of our organizations, amongst the new volunteers that are joining me in this, in this journey, as we set a new path, actually we enhance the path that we're on, to not only make this region better, the entire state and the entire country better. It's our opportunity, it's, our time is now to continue to set an example that's noticed by other parts of the state. What's going on in Southwest Indiana? We have a special group of people, of citizens, of community, of opportunity that will continue to make us successful well into the future. Christine touched on it. We must continue to challenge ourselves, each other, to live up to our motto that E truly is for everyone that we inspire, that we welcome, that we challenge. This isn't a yes man, yes, yes ma'am, yes sir situation. This is what if we did this? Debate, figure it out, and then move forward with the plan that we all are aligned on. And I'm not suggesting that everybody's gonna agree with everything that's done. Anybody that's in politics will tell you 51% or 49% is going to hate what you're doing. But we will make decisions and we will always make decisions to move the, the, this region forward. And it will be with thoughtful approach and by committee. It's also important that we remain nimble. You heard that word earlier tonight. Things aren't always going to work out or you're not going to get to the end goal the exact way that you had laid out. You will adjust your game plan as you go
to the finish line. And this community has done so far better than some of the other regions that we have been able to really witness and see peer, peer communities that have not been able to strive to move forward, that have taken steps backwards in many cases. Let's be the light, let's be the example, let's be the, the real focus of this group is to make us something that we continue to be proud of. We will continue to honor our history here. It is a great history in this area. We will be mindful of that history. We will learn from that history, but we will take risks and we will do it together. It's gonna be a prosperous future for all of us, but it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen with a lot of hard work and it doesn't happen with some setbacks. Everyone's been dealt with one. We're dealing with it as a community today, but we're dealing with it in the right way, with the right leadership, whether it be the, the mayor's office, our local businesses, local nonprofits, all of our community is moving forward. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank the school systems, the EVSC, the University of Evansville, University of Southern Indiana, Ivy Tech, that understand the importance of education. We can't st take a step back as a community. And you guys have done all the right things to give, us, give our, our children uh, an opportunity to overcome some of the challenges we're facing today. So as I conclude, I am going to ask that Colin Holman, our, who is the Associate Executive Director of the Ford Center, come to the stage. We do have proper exit strategies on how we're going to get out of this building. But just to close tonight, I want to thank everyone for your attendance, both here in person and virtual. And thank you for your commitment to the Chamber of Commerce. We truly appreciate the support and thank you all for a great evening. Be safe, be healthy, and be well. Thank you. All righty. Thank you for being here with us tonight. I will say it's been 201 days since we opened up the doors to guests. That was OVC Championship Night. So we're very thankful and happy to welcome our friends and the community into the Ford Center tonight. So, so to make sure we get all out safely, we're going to start at the back of the room. We're going to go kind of rows, kind of left to right. For those that came in through the front lobby doors, what is it? Exit out through the back door that you came in through, the back floor entrance point. There'll be some restrooms on your way out, and uh, we'll kind of go for them. So we'll start at the back, please. Back row, if you... Thank you for being here. Have a good evening. <laughs>